is going on, guys? Thank you so very much for joining me right here on the podcast. This is Off The Script, episode 287, part number two for your Saturday, August 17th, 2019. If you guys were wondering, I'm sure everybody is wondering, why Samoa Joe one week helped Roman Reigns out of the quote-unquote car accident and turn babyface, ultimately to turn heel again on Monday Night Raw in Canada against Sami Zayn. If you guys were wondering why this happened, don't worry, I have the answers for you right here on the podcast, and it is absolutely ridiculous. It is absolutely ridiculous. WWE's reasoning doesn't even make any sense whatsoever, so we're going to go over that right here on Off The Script. What is WWE's final destination with Rey Mysterio and Andrade Cien Almas? Over and over and over again, we got Rey versus Andrade. It means nothing. Two out of three falls. One week, Andrade's taking the mask off of Rey. The next week, Rey Mysterio is losing a two out of three falls match. Two to zero. Where are they going? Why are they fighting? What is the reason behind it? I have WWE's final destination for both Rey Mysterio and Andrade Cien Almas. Nia Jax deletes her Twitter account and reportedly is transforming herself in 2020. Nia Jax deleting her Twitter account may be the greatest accomplishment that this woman has ever seen under a WWE contract. What do you want me to say about that? People are wondering and worrying. Oh my God, Nia Jax! deletes her Twitter account. Where is she going? Who cares? Do you even realize she's off TV? I don't. In fact, the women's division, well, the women's division is complete garbage, but the women's division is not suffering whatsoever without Nia Jax. Chad Gable. Chad Gable. Apparently, WWE is giving him a new name. And folks, I pray to the gods of WWE creating names that this name does not happen. That this name is not seen on television, nor is it ever heard from, ever. And I hope to God that Vince McMahon go goes and gets a brain check, because this is absolutely something that could kill all credibility for Chad Gable. So we're going to go over that as well, the ridiculous name change that Vince McMahon is possibly thinking about for Chad Gable. WWE moving towards unique stages for pay-per-view. Finally... And Buddy Murphy and Roman Reigns, was it all a botch? Oh my God, that may be the greatest botch in WWE history. We're going to talk about it right here on Off The Script. I had to record two episodes in a single day. I am absolutely exhausted. On top of that, normally I wouldn't be exhausted, but the fact that I am operating at like 50%, is very difficult for me, so I hope you guys appreciate the podcast this weekend. And I had to do double uploads in one day. Well, not double uploads on YouTube, but I had to double record and double upload to get you guys ready for the weekend because I had already planned a trip to Boston, Mass. I'm going to go to the bar, and then I'm going to get in my car, and then I'm going to go to Fenway Park because that's where I'm going. Going to go see the Red Sox game this weekend. I think they're playing the Orioles. Nor do I care. I don't really give a shit who they're playing. My Braves are in first place. Up on the Mets by 10. I guarantee you that will be dwindled down to 2 by the end of uh, September because the Braves bullpen is absolutely a tr- The Braves bullpen is like Monday Night Raw in the third hour. Garbage. So, I'm going to Boston, Massachusetts. I got my good buddies, Drew. And Tom out there, and we're going to do some day drinking. We're going to go to the Red Sox game. I don't know what they're doing, but I know I'm going to the Red Sox game. But I am making a trip out there primarily to visit the Samuel Adams Brewery. So I will be doing that this weekend. It will be my first time ever. And apparently they have beers that you could take home from their barrel-aged series. And you guys know about me and my craft beer. I'm all about the craft in craft beer, so that's going to be interesting as well, Uh, so the reason I did these double uploads under the circumstances that I am in right now with my illness 
is because I had to get ready for Boston. So there might not be a Sunday upload because I'm running through all the news on Friday and Saturday. So if you guys are wondering where's JD on Sundays off the script, you guys know I am coming back from Boston. So that is what I am doing, and I hope I have a good time. That's all I ask for. Boston, uh, Massachusetts in general is not one of my favorite places to be, but being that two of my good friends live out there, we're going to have a damn good time. So hopefully you guys enjoy this podcast, and we got a lot to get into right here on Off The Script. Make sure you guys go and check out all the other videos that you might have missed this week. Summer Scam! You guys know the deal about that. Thank you for 52,000 views and over 2,100 likes on that particular podcast. Monday Night Raw, Sasha Banks and the boss returned. She turned heel and got a standing ovation for destroying Natty in Canada on Monday Night Raw. SmackDown Live, we seen Roman Reigns and Buddy Murphy absolutely tear the house down on SmackDown Live. NXT, Vince McMahon, and ooh, <laughs> you thought I was going to stay away from NXT for all these years, right? Now it's going to be my time to come on in and show you how it's done over here. Everybody in NXT is going to have a little taste of them. Uh, wood. It's going to happen, folks. It's going to happen. I know you're all majorly disappointed and depressed. I know. Please don't fuck with my NXT, but it's going to happen. We talk about Vince McMahon and Kevin Dunn taking over NXT or having a little bit more control over NXT, depending on if it goes live on FS1. And then, obviously, I would have had the thumbnail for yesterday's video, but I'm recording this back-to-back, -back, and Salrex is not a miracle worker, so he didn't get me the thumbnail on time, but you guys could go check out part one of Off The Script as well. We talk about Dolph Ziggler. Listen to this story. Dolph Ziggler is such an idiot that he shook Vince McMahon's hand and actually thought he was going to keep a promise about not letting him out of his, or, or letting him out of his contract. So he shook Vince McMahon's hand, thinking that Vince was going to let him out of his contract when he desired, and Vince said, what are you talking about? I'm not letting you out of your contract. I'm going back on what I said. I'd rather pay you to sit at home so that you don't go and do anything else. So that was the major story on Off the Script yesterday, plus all the Bray Wyatt news that you need, including Bray Wyatt and The Fiend being part of DLC in WWE 2K20. Make sure you guys go and check all that stuff out down in the comments. I'm going to pin the comment at the very top. Everything you need is easy access down there for you guys. Go and show some support. Make sure you guys follow me on social media, man. At JD from NY206. That's on Twitter and Instagram. Most importantly, hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on that bell for all notifications. And if you guys want to support the podcast via Patreon, patreon.com slash JD from NY206. You guys are going to get the audio versions and the video versions early access on Patreon right here for this weekend's Off The Script. The podcast today is brought to you by my fine friends over at The Ridge. Ridge.com slash script. And you guys could use code SCRIPT at checkout for 10% off. I have The Ridge wallet, but they just do not deal in wallets, guys. They have USB cables, backpacks, knives, power blocks, and... They have everything you need to make your day-to-day -day life easy and simple. I have the wallet. I will be getting the power block and some USB cables. We're going to be showing them off right here on the podcast. But my Ridge wallet, I absolutely love it, man. And I think you guys are going to feel the same way about it. And if you guys want to try it out for yourself, I can save you some money. Ridge.com slash script and code script at checkout for 10% off. You're going to get a lifetime guarantee with the Ridge Wallet, man. The wallet is so overbuilt that they do not hesitate at all to include a lifetime guarantee. It's got RFID blocking. What that means is that you guys can breathe easy because your cards will be surrounded by the metal body of this wallet, protecting them from even the most powerful RFID chip readers. You, you guys will not be compromised in your information and debit cards, credit cards will not be compromised at all by using this wallet. It is functional and slim. It holds 1 to 12 cards without stretching out. The slim wallet is ideal for carrying business cards, which I always do. I gave my business cards to Matt and Nick Jackson of the Young Bucks, and I pulled it out of my Ridge wallet. Credit cards, debit cards, bills. 
The outside notch allows you to push out the cards very easily. Integrated money clip. The metal money clip allows you to clip several bills inside your wallet. It's also available with the cash strap or money clip. Either one, it's up to you guys. And the ultimate durability with this wallet, man. Aluminum plating and interchangeable elastic screws made from 6061 T6 aluminum and iodized gunmetal, man. This is absolutely a beast of a wallet. Again, ridge.com slash script. Use code script at checkout. You guys are going to get 10% off. And make sure you guys tell them that JD sent you to help support off the script. Man, you want to talk about convoluted. You want to talk about something that doesn't make any sense. You want to talk about WWE being indecisive. All you need to do is look at Samoa Joe in his aid of Roman Reigns trying to find the culprit of who tried to run him over. He was a babyface one week. And then WWE conveniently rolls into Toronto for SummerSlam weekend on that Monday Night Raw at the Scotiabank Arena in a match with Sami Zayn. Samoa Joe turned heel again. Nobody understood why. Nobody knew why. And I got the answer for you. And it's one that I mentioned as being convoluted. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. In fact, you might laugh when you hear this reason. Now, Samoa Joe's behavior, like I mentioned, babyface, heel, saving Roman Reigns, and then shitting all over those same people who are worried about Roman Reigns. When Roman's car was hit by an attacker on Monday Night Raw last week, Joe went from wanting to beat up Roman himself to getting help quickly and making sure he was okay. On Monday Night Raw this week, after the Street Profits tricked Sami Zayn into insulting Samoa Joe, Joe challenged Sami Zayn to a match, and he quickly won in about 60 seconds. Typical Sami Zayn length of a match with the Coquina Clutch. By this point, given what a hateable character Sami Zayn is playing these days, it really seemed like Joe had finally turned babyface and was starting anew. He was starting fresh. We all thought that maybe Samoa Joe could get on the right track and maybe win some goddamn matches on Monday Night Raw. Took the microphone after he choked out Sami Zayn and he cut what was a heel promo, even shitting on the crowd and telling them that they're not forgiven for thinking the worst of him. So what is this? Then on Tuesday night, he is showcased next to Shane McMahon in challenging Kevin Owens in Toronto. I don't know, man. I don't know. Is Samoa Joe the new big show? I pray to God not. Please. He's already had enough hardships on the Monday Night Raw roster. Dave Meltzer points out on Wrestling Observer Live, the likely point was to keep the beloved Sami Zayn in Canada, right? A baby face. He's a detestable heel, says Dave Meltzer, and they did not want him getting cheers in Canada. This is what Meltzer says, and I quote, They were in Toronto. They knew that Sami Zayn was going to get this incredible pop, but Sami, isn't he from Montreal? Don't Toronto people hate Montreal people? Is that a thing? I don't know. Some people were telling me that's the reason why Natty got a very lukewarm reaction. Because she's from Calgary, Alberta, and SummerSlam was in Toronto. Who gives a shit? It's forever away. I don't know if that's true or not, but please, elaborate down in the comments below. So, they thought that Sammy was going to get this incredible pop because he's Canadian. That was the last thing that they wanted. With this gimmick, they did not want Sammy getting this incredible pop. Yes, yes, because... You are so invested in the Sami Zayn character. You care so much about the well-being of Sami Zayn on television that he hasn't won a match since WrestleMania season. Are you fucking kidding me? Seriously, I would look a WWE executive in the face and I would say exactly that. You're worried about him getting cheered? 
How about you start getting him some fucking wins on the main roster? And one of those things is they had Samoa Joe call him Kevin Owens' water boy and stuff like that. They knew that people would go crazy for a Samoa Joe turn and they would enable. Basically, they're not going to boo Samoa Joe when they first turn him because everybody wants to turn, wants him to turn, but they don't want him to turn yet. So it was to keep Sami Zayn from being cheered and Samoa Joe just had to do that and turn right back because even though they know people are ready to cheer him like crazy and may turn him at some point, this is not the week they wanted to do that, end quote. So, let me get this straight. Let me try to understand this. If the last thing that I just ranted on was not enough, because Sami Zayn, I mean, man, we got to protect those incredible pops from Sami Zayn. We got to protect Sami Zayn's character here because he's such a detestable heel who can't win a fucking match to save his life. And now he's in the King of the Ring. He lost to Samoa Joe in 60 seconds. Guarantee you his King of the Ring outing is going to be 30 seconds. His first match in the King of the Ring is going to be about 30 seconds. Let me get this straight. You show babyface tendencies for Samoa Joe here on Monday Night Raw with Roman Reigns, who I honestly feel fans are now siding with more so than ever before. A babyface turn for Samoa Joe that is desperately needed because the heel run for Samoa Joe at the hands of Vince McMahon has been a complete disaster. He is just as bad as Sami Zayn. Loser. You want to give Samoa Joe this sympathetic, emotional moment with Roman Reigns that shows not only is he a badass and not afraid of confronting anybody, but has a heart. In that moment, because anyone in that given moment would have done the same thing no matter how much you hate the individual who's being attacked. That was a real life moment and a real life instance in which many people can relate to Samoa Joe. You want to jeopardize all that because you're going to Canada, Toronto of all people, of all places, with Sami Zayn of all people as his opponents. How about this? How about you don't book Samoa Joe against Sami Zayn? How difficult would it have been for you guys not to do that? I don't know. I could have thought of a handful of other guys you could have put in the ring with Samoa Joe so that you didn't need to convolute his obvious babyface turn. So you risk this natural progression for a city that... How many times do they go to Toronto in one year? One, if that. Sometimes none. Against Sami Zayn, of all people. Like, Sami Zayn is going to get cheered, and that's going to make any difference for the Sami Zayn character. As if Sami Zayn is going to walk on into Toronto a year later, and then not have the ability to fucking put himself over as a heel in front of the audience. Are you fucking kidding me? Seriously, this is absolutely one of the dumbest reasons to turn anyone back into a heel. Instead of naturally watching the progression of the Samoa Joe character, they actually took a step back for the city of Toronto and Sami Zayn because they didn't want Sami Zayn getting cheers in Toronto. Uh, Sami Zayn has some of the best mic skills on the main roster. You don't think that that man could pick up a microphone and get people to fucking boo him on a whim? Come on, man. Wow, WWE is... Oh, I, I wonder what goes through the fucking minds of these people when they're writing this show. Really? Do they think about anything? I mean, I don't even write for this company. I have no script here. I, I, I come up with this off the top of my head. The only thing I have written is the bullet points for the fucking news article. Unreal. Now, I'm not saying that Samoa Joe is not going to have a... A, a, a baby face turn that's successful, but you had a genuine one. It was naturally there. We've seen the progression of it. Why didn't you go through with it? Oh, because we have to pre protect the Sami Zayn character. If you wanted to protect the Sami Zayn character, you would have given him a few fucking wins in the last four months, which you haven't even done that. 
Shame on you, WWE. And you guys are expecting change on Monday Night Raw. If they can't even get this right, and they go about stupidly booking this, where's the change coming from? This is right back to their old habits. What a dumb fucking mistake this was. Samoa Joe needs a babyface turn, and I think people are ready to cheer Samoa Joe as long as you don't compromise and jeopardize the true nature of the Samoa Joe character. I think people are ready to cheer him. And a faction with Roman Reigns is something that I would be highly interested in because at that point, you would be aligning Roman Reigns with someone that I actually enjoy very much. And by default, Roman might be a little bit more appealing on WWE television. So we'll see what happens there. But that is a stupid fucking reason if I ever seen one. WWE's final destination, Fort Rey Mysterio and Andrade Cien Almas. Dave Meltzer noted on the Wrestling Observer Radio that the WWE had WrestleMania plans for both guys in a hair versus mask match. Those plans didn't happen because WWE didn't want Andrade to shave his hair. Thank God. I have enough time, or a more difficult time, I should say, watching Shawn Michaels continuously wear a baseball cap knowing that he has no hair underneath. And worse yet, maybe wrestle bald. Bald Shawn Michaels has never left my my mind, stemming from whatever happened in November with that joke of a match at Crown Jewel. Now, although he did not reveal what WWE's plans might be, it's anyone's guess whether WWE will actually follow through with these plans for Rey Mysterio and Andrade. One thing can be said, though, there will not be a hair versus mask match because, like I said, nobody in WWE wants Andrade to shave his hair, and Rey Mysterio obviously cannot lose his mask. Dave Melcher says this, and I quote, It's like they probably have a destination, but what are the odds that by the time they get there, they actually get there? It didn't work last time. I mean, the last time they had a destination, they didn't get to it. I mean, they got nowhere near it. It just blew off, or they just blew it off, says Dave Meltzer. So the destination they had last time was Mask versus Hair at WrestleMania, which didn't happen. The only thing I can say is that this destination is not that destination, end quote. So I don't know where they're going with this at all. All I know is that Rey Mysterio had tears in his eyes on Monday Night Raw, and I can honestly, I can honestly say, I heard rumors about Dominic, his son, getting back on WWE television. Dominic was first seen in the feud with Samoa Joe, but clearly that went nowhere because Rey Mysterio got hurt. So I don't know where they were planning on going with that. Maybe they want to bring Dominic back to WWE television as a sympathetic figure in Rey Mysterio's career here. Maybe Dominic gets his father back on track. Maybe having his son on television gives Rey Mysterio some new hope some new spirit to go out there and start winning some matches. I don't know where they're going with Rey Mysterio. All I see is a broken down Hall of Famer who is miserable about being in WWE legitimately and signed a 18-month to 24-month contract, and WWE gave him an out clause at 18 months, which is coming up at the end of WrestleMania season in 2020, and I could see Rey Mysterio going to All Elite Wrestling. I don't know why Rey Mysterio would want to be with the WWE for two years in full because the first year in Rey Mysterio's WWE run, the latest run, uh, was nothing but injuries and shitty creative. And they didn't do anything with him at all. Anything. Three matches with Ricochet, AJ Styles, and, and uh, Andrade. Uh, Andrade, we got some decent matches, but nothing uh, as far as what we, you know, know those guys could really do on pay-per-view. They haven't even been given a fucking pay-per-view spotlight to do what they do. It's always mired with commercials, and it's fucking... Like like this past week, where Ray's getting buried. Nobody wants to see that. I'm not going to get behind Ray Mysterio if you continually push him as a pushover and a, and a scrub. Nobody wants to see that shit. Ray Mysterio and all the matches that he could have had, we have not gotten yet. And I thought him coming back was going to be some sort of big deal. I, I, I knew as soon as he walked back into the WWE, everything that he was doing on the indies, he was hot. Ray Mysterio was a hot commodity again in his career. What he did on Lucha Underground with, you know, D Dario Cueto and fucking everything else there, you know. He, he did that. 
Matanza. He had some great matches with fucking Matanza. Great matches with uh, Johnny Mundo. I don't know what was going on there. Rey Mysterio had this resurgence. And then he did All In last year. And he was affiliated with the Elite. And clearly, they would love to have Rey Mysterio back in their company. Now, All Elite Wrestling. I I can't see Rey Mysterio staying for the full 24 months here in WWE. Maybe WWE wants to get Dominic back on television and they want to keep him on television. Maybe they want Dominic to be the heir apparent to whatever Rey Mysterio is doing. Maybe they want Dominic to wrestle in the mask. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe Rey is really... Maybe Rey gave his notice to Vince McMahon telling Vince McMahon that, listen, I'm out after 18 months. Dominic could take my place. Sign my son to a contract so he's good off. Give him my mask. I'll pass the mask down. Maybe they do a a, a father versus son match and he passes the mask down. I don't know. That could be an epic moment if they want to do it. And then Ray is out. Then Ray could go to AEW. I don't know. But there was news on Dominic. WWE could be launching big plans for Dominic. Now, a lot of these plans, we don't really know what WWE has in mind. But one thing was mentioned in the dirt sheets this week. And a lot of people are wondering... Why WWE just doesn't start Dominic off in NXT. Now, given his current relationship with WWE and being that his father is on the main roster, the better option, says WWE, is to keep Dominic on the main roster with his father and instead of going to NXT, they don't think that's the best way to get Dominic over. They feel like being associated with his father on the main roster and being in front of the main roster eyes and being that the son of a Hall of Famer, it's going to get him over Much, much more. And I do agree with that. I don't think someone like Dominic needs NXT. The Performance Center is always going to be there. NXT is always going to be there if he needs to go down there and learn. But putting him on NXT show is not going to really do anything for him. He's going to get over and going to get to where he needs to be by standing side by side with his father. So they have a ton of different ways to go about this. Maybe, like I said, Ray gave notice to Vince and he's on his way out after WrestleMania next year, and we get a father versus son match, and it's something that is very heartfelt, and he passes the mask down, and his son takes his place in WWE and wrestles under the greatest mask of all time. I don't know. It's an option. So we'll see what happens, but Rey Mysterio on Andrade, I think right now, is finished, but after what happened with Rey Mysterio on Monday, who knows where WWE is going next with Rey Mysterio. Nia Jax! She deletes her Twitter account, reportedly transforms herself, and she's getting ready for a return in the first quarter of 2020. Now, Nia Jax deleted her Twitter account, but there isn't anything to fear because she had a very good reason for doing so. She did keep her Instagram account open, though, and she deleted any and all reference to WWE from her Instagram description. Nia Jax posted an Instagram story Today, actually, on Thursday, you guys will be seeing this on Saturday, so it might be gone by then, but I'm sure you can find screenshots of it. And she gave an update as to why she deleted her Twitter. She says this on her Instagram story, and she pretty much took a screen cap of a meme or a phrase on words, and it said this, and I quote, Privacy is power. What people don't know, they can't ruin. End quote. Now, Brett Shepard's reporting that Nia Jax deleted her Twitter account because she's working on transforming herself. She is focused on herself more during her recovery from injury. Therefore, Twitter was a distraction that she did not need. Brett Shepard says this, and I quote, A source in WWE told me that Nia did this to focus on transforming herself and preparing for her return and to focus less on social media for the time being. I'm told this is nothing to be alarmed over, and her estimated return remains the first quarter of 2020. As you guys know, or you might not know, let me fill you in here. Nia Jax had two damaged ACLs that needed surgery, and she will be back in the first quarter of 2020. Uh, I am not missing Nia Jax, nor do I even realize that she's gone. She was god-awful. She was god-awful at what she did, and she was actually a hindrance on the overall quality of the show. I mean this wholeheartedly. If you're a fan of Nia Jax, I don't give a shit. She was awful. I am glad she wants to transform herself. And you know what? Even though I said those horrible things just a second ago, I would give Nia Jax a shot 
to see if she can redeem herself from the misery that she put us through in 2018. If she can transform herself and get herself battle ready to come back and look good and slim down and just go in there wanting to go to war and really be a better version of herself, not only mentally, physically, but in that ring, be better than we've ever seen her before. Because honestly, Nia Jax was as green as fucking grass. She did nothing. Nothing in that ring that really blew me away whatsoever. In fact, I reached for the remote control more times than not when Nia Jax was on TV. Terrible on the mic, terrible in the ring. If she can do what she needs to do and get better in the ring, I would absolutely love that. I really would. Because she has the figure of a dominating force and they were building her up as such. And I had high hopes for Nia Jax. And she just fell flat on her face. I think the biggest thing that Nia Jax is known for is for breaking Becky Lynch's nose. And that's pretty much it. She did absolutely nothing. Nothing. To warrant any type of praise on the main roster. Just god-awful match after god-awful match. And Tamina, oh my god. If this means... If this means... That Nia Jax comes back and we see Tamina on television again and they pair these two Samoans together. Please, please, spare me. Tamina does not need to be on television. Tamina needs to be on the unemployment line. Uh, Nia Jax, if she could get herself better, clearly is the better of the two in that tandem. Let's see what she can do. I am willing to give her a shot. Hopefully she transforms herself and is much better than when we seen her in 2018. But deleting her social media? Listen, that is a blessing to anyone who wants to do that, man, because social media, Twitter in itself, Twitter in its own right, is absolutely a cesspool of garbage. What is a cesspool of garbage? It is the imagination of Vince McMahon. Chad Gable. Chad Gable could possibly be getting a ridiculous, and I mean ridiculous, name change on WWE television. According to PW Insider's Mike Johnson, Vince McMahon could be set to give Chad Gable a ridiculous new name. Per Mike Johnson's report, WWE recently filed a trademark on a new name after SmackDown Live. I didn't see... Th was Chad Gable even on SmackDown Live? Or maybe they did a WWE.com exclusive. Whatever. Whatever. The last we see of Chad Gable on WWE television, he was being mocked by Elias for his height. You gotta be this high to step in the ring with Elias. Whatever. Now, on this week's SmackDown Live, apparently after the show went off the air, they did something on, on YouTube or, or social media or something. Shelton Benjamin called his former tag team partner, Chad Gable, Shorty. Let me repeat that. Shorty. Ch Chad Gable was referred to as Shorty by Shelton Benjamin. Now, this comes one week after Elias mocked Gable for his hide on SmackDown Live, like I just previously mentioned. On that note, Johnson claims that WWE could be hinting at a potential name change for the former Raw, SmackDown, and NXT Tag Team Champion. He says this, and I quote, The future of Chad Gable might be obscured a bit. There was a promo that they released after SmackDown with Shelton Benjamin talking about King of the Ring, and Chad Gable was standing next to him. He said, Hey, Shelton, what's up? Shelton looked at him and said, Shorty! And walked away. We noted a couple of weeks ago, says Mike Johnson on PW Insider, we noted a couple of weeks ago that WWE has copyrighted the name Shorty G for a potential character. If Chad Gable is going to be Shorty G, if that's where they're going with it, I don't sense a bunch of upward mobility in his future with his character, says Mike Johnson. You think? Shorty G. Is he a fucking rapper? Yeah, uh, coming up on stage, opening act for Eminem, Shorty G. Are you fucking kidding me? So if the report is to be believed, WWE and Vince McMahon could be planning to give one of their most talented, underutilized, and underrated wrestlers. A potential name in Shorty G. You want to kill this guy's career? Then you rename him Shorty G. 
I, I don't know what else to say. I'm I'm shocked. This is the first time reading this. Shorty G. Shorty G. I I don't know. I I I don't know. I don't know. I don't I don't even know how these things get passed. I, I don't even know how these things get fucking to the pen to the paper. I, I really don't. Now we could be overreacting here. These reports could be completely false. Mike Johnson could be completely wrong in this. I, I don't see anyone changing the name of Chad Gable to Shorty G. How is that going to make him a serious contender for anything? Sounds like he's going for the 24-7 title and not any other title. He's in the king of the ring, mind you. How are you going to have a potential king by the name of Shorty G? I hope to God this is completely misunderstood or a complete misunderstanding. Shorty G, that would be one of the worst name changes I think I've ever heard. Seriously. Is he about to get his own fucking comedy skit on Comedy Central? Is he, is he about to be put on Saturday Night Live, Shorty G? Here's, a, here's the next segment with Shorty G. WWE Superstar Show. What the fuck? God, that is awful. Chad Gable has one of the biggest upsides if they want to utilize him. He's like he's like Buddy Murphy. There's un, untapped potential there in Chad Gable. The guy could legitimately be the second coming of a mixture of Daniel Bryan and Kurt Angle. If they really wanted and they haven't done anything with him. I, I hated the fact that they even broke him and Jason Jordan up. I hated the fact that they broke American Alpha up. They fucked American Alpha up, just like they fucked every other tag team that came up from NXT. They fucked the Ascension. They ruined... They're about to ruin Heavy Machinery. They ruined AOP. They ruined the Hype Bros. Every... They, they ruined the, the fucking team of Sin Cara and... And, uh, what's his name? Kalisto. The, uh, the, the, the Lucha Dragons, they ruined every tag team from NXT. And if you don't think Street Profits and the Undisputed Era are next, you're a fool. They ruined every single tag team that came up from NXT for whatever reason. Sanity, the War Raiders, you name it, man. They are ruined. American Alpha should have never been broken up. Uh, it, it was during a time, a day and age, where WWE had this thing about breaking up fucking tag teams. They broke up Enzo and Cass, and then they broke up Gable and Jordan. Jordan is another one. He had such a huge upside, and he was in matches with John Cena on one, on one week during Monday Night Raw. Then the next week, he was in a match with Roman Reigns, and he, he excelled. Those were great matches. But he was never accepted by the fans. He was never accepted by the fans. He, he just looked like a fish out of water. He was completely out of place. Teaming with Rollins, tag team champion, Kurt Angle's illegitimate son... Well, Chad Gable was the was the guy who was left out, and he had just as much potential as Jason Jordan. Why you would break up a tag team like that, I, I have no idea, man. I really don't. The Revival is another one. They fucked the Revival over big time. It's just unbelievable how the WWE just doesn't know what to do with these types of guys, man. It's just unreal. Meanwhile, this guy could... You could put Chad Gable on AEW's roster, and he could have an absolute fucking classic... With Kenny Omega. Just just think about it. Just think about it. That's the type of guy that they have. And I don't know why talent like this is just... Just overseen and just willingly wasted without a care in the world. Shorty G. I hope to God that isn't a real deal. And that is just simply what they call him behind the scenes off television. I hope to God it is. Because if that's the case, this guy's career is absolutely ruined. And never to be recovered again. WWE reportedly moving towards unique stages for the rest of the year for pay-per-view. I wonder why! I wonder why. Oh, JD, you're an AEW dick licker! Yeah, it's the AEW effect, folks. Because if WWE wanted to stand out and make their pay-per-view special, they would have made their pay-per-views special already. The only time we get unique sets is for WrestleMania. How many SummerSlams have we had in the last four years where they had a unique set? Zero. Zero. That's going back the last five years. Four in Brooklyn, this year in Toronto. Now all of a sudden, now all of a sudden they want to have unique sets. I wonder why. I guess those poker chips in Las Vegas for double or nothing really made a big impact on Vince McMahon and WWE. Ah, oh, we got to get unique sets for our pay-per-view. Yeah, now... Now, I wonder why you're using Pyro, too. 
AEW effect, folks. Don't let it fool you. WWE has a lot of money, clearly, from the Saudi Arabian deal, the Fox deal, the NBC Universal. They'll be rolling in money by the end of the year. According to a source to WWE, says Brad Shepard, WWE is going back to unique pay-per-view stages, starting with Survivor Series. So the next major pay-per-view for WWE is Survivor Series. Oh, but JD, it's Clash of Champions. No. Survivor Series is one of the big four. The big four. So they're starting with that. I also heard that WWE for SmackDown on Fox, they're going back and using the original SmackDown fist because that's great and that's what needs to be done. You need to give these shows separate identity. Raw cannot look like SmackDown and SmackDown cannot look like Raw. Not only aesthetically through the stage setup, but through the roster as well. So let's go that extra mile and make this a true brand split with both rosters having a separate identity, Vince. Glad you're on the right track here. This is what needs to be done. A lot of fans actually miss the custom pay-per-view sets. I know I do. I know I do. I love the custom pay-per-view sets, man. It sets everything apart and gives you a feel like this show is important. Instead of watching these fucking shows and it's like, man, SummerSlam feels like a three-hour Monday Night Raw on a Sunday night. You go watch SummerSlam, and then you watch that set, and watch that show, and it's the same thing that you're watching on Monday Night Raw. Not really too exciting about that. Well, there's nothing too exciting about that, I should say. But hopefully WWE does do this, and this rumor is actually legit. Pay-per-view sets? Yes, please. I welcome them. I would love to have original pay-per-view sets back. Everybody always mentions... The original Madison Square Garden Royal Rumble set. I forgot what year it was. I believe it was. With, I believe it was with Triple H and Mick Foley in that uh, in that street fight that they had. And Madison Square Garden had the short ramp that they used to have, and above it hung a yellow New York City taxi cab. You know, crashing through a brick wall or something like that. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I remember the yellow taxi. That's unique. I love that. Something so simple. Something so. So basic like that adds a lot and it gives the overall pay-per-view a different feel, you know, because you're not going to see that any other time. Shit like that, you know, with the TLC pay-per-views, they used to have like ladders hanging down. You don't even see that anymore. You don't even see that anymore. The last time we seen that, I think uh, Wade Barrett got buried under all those ladders, you know, well, that, that wasn't even, that wasn't even TLC. That was SummerSlam. They did that. There was a fucking huge string of ladders just hanging down. But you guys get what I get what I'm saying. You know, for uh, what was it? Um, Armageddon. I I would just visualize Armageddon. You see like fire and you know broken down fucking vehicles and destruction in the aisleway. I want unique pay per view sets. It just gives a different feel. So hopefully WWE could do that and we can have these pay per views stand out from what we usually see on Monday and Tuesday night. Guys, we're going to get into the Roman Reigns, Buddy Murphy situation in just a little bit, but I have to support my friends over at Harry's, harrys.com slash script. You guys know the deal about Harry's. I've been using Harry's for two years, and let me tell you, man, this is the best shave of my entire life, and I want you guys to do the same thing and use our unique link to get your own $13 value trial set, harrys.com slash script. Join the 10 million, including myself, who have tried Harry's today. Harry's founders were just two regular guys who were tired of getting ripped off and paying for overpriced gimmicks, vibrating heads, flex balls, handles that look like a prop in a cheesy sci-fi movie. These are just some of the tactics that the leading brands have used to overcharge us for years. Harry's makes quality, durable blades at a fair price. Guys, it's just $2 per blade. To keep prices that low, they cut out the middleman. Harry's bought a world-class blade factory in Germany that's been making some of the best razor blades in the world for 99 years. Now they can provide great quality at factory direct prices. And on top of that, guys, they're going to give you a 100% quality guarantee. If you don't love your shave, let them know, and they will give you a full refund. JD, this sounds great. What am I going to get in my $13 value trial set? Well, Senor Goon, you guys are going to get this. You're going to get a razor handle with an easy grip. Choice of color is yours. Orange, the navy blue, or the evergreen. Five-blade razor with a lubricating strip and a trimmer blade for a close, comfortable shave. 
rich lathering shave gel that will leave you smelling great. And let me tell you, man, when you apply it on your face, it's going to feel even better. And a travel blade cover to keep your razor dry and easy on the go. Great if you're a man or woman of business or if you guys just want to make it look nice and make a nice presentation on your bathroom sink like I do. Listeners of my show can redeem their trial set at harrys.com slash script. Guys, make sure you go to harrys.com slash script to redeem your offer and let them know that I sent you to help support Off The Scripts. When SmackDown Live was over on Tuesday night, we were all jumping for joy that Buddy Murphy finally got his opportunity and Buddy Murphy hit an absolute grand slam out of the park and drove in every single base runner that was on base, won the game for his team. He was heralded as WWE's best kept secret for no longer. The secret was out. I want to think with this storyline, that Buddy Murphy was always in the plans for WWE. I want I want to believe that. Any good story is thought out well in advance. Every good story has a plan and characters are in place. You know what type of role you're going to be playing. And then there are things that happen because WWE doesn't realize what's going on around them and shit happens by mistake and then WWE has to backtrack because they don't have any plans and they don't have any direction on where they want to go and then we get the story like we got today with Buddy Murphy and Buddy Murphy apparently was never supposed to be a part of this storyline with Roman Reigns, Daniel Bryan, and Eric Rowan. Or Rowan, I'm sorry. Eric Rowan, Rowan, whatever. Rowan. Apparently, WWE turned this botch into an angle for Buddy Murphy. Brian Alvarez ranted a bit yesterday. I love when Brian Alvarez rants because he sounds like me. He ranted on Wrestling Observer Live this week where he seemed to let something out of the bag as far as Buddy Murphy goes. He said Buddy Murphy was accidentally caught on camera before Roman Reigns' forklift accident. Now, he goes on to credit WWE for being able to come up with a way to insert Buddy Murphy into the storyline, even after fans on social media made the discovery that he was part of the shot when Roman had the, I guess, the backstage equipment and the crates fall on top of him. Then later on, Rowan was inserted into another angle that they aired on TV and carried on with the storyline. Therefore, after seeing the news break online about Buddy Murphy being backstage with Roman Reigns, it is said that WWE made the decision to insert Buddy Murphy into the storyline. It really seemed to work out for Buddy because he had his first match on SmackDown since... April 15, April 16 of this year, and it was against Roman Reigns. Not only was it widely praised by the wrestling community, Roman Reigns put over Buddy Murphy on Twitter as well and said he would welcome another shot and another opportunity to be in the ring with Buddy Murphy. You cannot get any bigger praise than that. You cannot get any bigger praise than that. So for the people who are saying, oh, Buddy lost, he looked like a loser anyway, yes, please elaborate some more on how stupid... You really are. I don't know. I am very conflicted with this. I I am very conflicted with this. On one hand, I want to joke about it, and I want to say maybe Buddy Murphy intentionally put himself there because he knew what he was doing. He figured if he could get seen on camera that people would kind of be, I would say, on his side. Oh, look, Buddy's in the shot. Oh, look, Buddy is a potential culprit. Here in this storyline, maybe he knew that he had to create an opportunity for himself and he kind of weaseled himself into the shot and then it was seen after the fact on social media and he made something happen for himself. He made an opportunity happen out of nothing, an opportunity happen that was never going to be given to him if he didn't take the ball and shoot his shot. I don't know. I don't know. I don't think WWE had plans for Buddy Murphy to be part of this whatsoever because 
WWE hasn't shown any sign of using Buddy Murphy on TV. The only thing that we got of Buddy Murphy was him in a town hall meeting with Shane McMahon kind of shitting on Kevin Owens. Kevin Owens mentioned that I should be getting an opportunity on TV. I don't need Kevin Owens to vouch for me. I'm going to make my own opportunity. Maybe that was taken in a kind of lackadaisical way, but you could look back at that and look at this. This is him making an opportunity for himself, folks. So is it really that difficult to, you know, sit here and think, well, you know, Buddy Murphy was in that shot. Who's to say it wasn't him who calculated this plan all along to get into that shot? So WWE had to force him into the storyline. Certainly a plausible situation. It really is. I don't think Buddy Murphy was ever going to be a part of this thing at all. Because what does Buddy Murphy have to do with Roman Reigns? That just seems like an oddball matchup. That's a matchup that WWE would use to give Roman a quick victory and move on to the next guy. You know, move on to something that he is already involved in. Yeah, Buddy Murphy's in my way. Let me get through this guy and then I'll move on to Daniel Bryan. But the match happened. Buddy Murphy got his opportunity and he absolutely nailed it. He hit it out of the park. 500 foot home run, man. There's no coming back from that. This is going to be the biggest night of his life. Never mind his career. This is the biggest night of his life. Because not only did he play up the, the, the WWE's best kept, best kept secret thing, the secret's no longer a secret anymore. It's out. He was in the ring with Roman Reigns. He delivered on every single aspect. He looked fantastic. There was no botches. He got in all of his offense plus some. Roman sold all of his offense. Near fall after near fall after near fall. There was two or three near falls in that match where Buddy Murphy could have easily won that match and Roman made him look good. Roman gave him the spotlight to do what he had to do. Roman could go in there and be self selfish. He could go in there and dictate the match. He's the big dog. Buddy Murphy's the rookie here. Roman Reigns could have went in there and dictated the match. You do what I say. I'm going to call this spot. You're going to lay down for me, Superman Punch Spear. We're going to go five minutes. That's it. He gave Buddy Murphy 13 minutes on SmackDown Live. And he took a lot of offense in that match. He was on the defense for most of that match. That is someone I can appreciate, man. I don't say that a lot about Roman Reigns. But on that night, on that night, he was selfless. And he gave that entire spotlight to Buddy Murphy. Roman knew, Roman knows that he's going to be the focus of this entire storyline. And just for a little bit, even if Buddy Murphy is not a part of this thing, he gave Buddy Murphy the, 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 the stage to pretty much show Vince McMahon. This was a showcase of Vince McMahon. He's in there with Vince McMahon's number one guy. Show Vince what you made of. Show Vince what you made of. And he absolutely nailed it. I don't see how anybody on social media, and if you do, you're a complete idiot. You should not be watching the sport. You're watching it all wrong. You're watching it all wrong. Buddy Murphy's not a loser. In what way did he come off a loser? Did he come off a loser by what he did in the ring? Because what I seen in the ring was a guy that could go in there and deliver a five-star match with anybody. With anybody. What I seen is a guy that deserves a fucking opportunity. What I see is a guy that deserves to be the king of the ring. Never mind Roman Reigns. The king of the ring. How you have this guy sitting on the sidelines for four months and this is what he's producing? This is what he has been producing. This is nothing new to me. This should not be something new to you. If you know who Buddy Murphy is by watching him in NXT and watching him on 205 Live, you know this is what he does. How could you have that sitting in the back in catering not wanting to use that? Can you imagine, can you imagine this match after watching this being left off the SummerSlam card? After what they did here, I would not have minded it to be on the SummerSlam card. It would have made the overall SummerSlam show a lot better. And being that we had four days in Toronto with NXT TakeOver, with SummerSlam, Raw, and SmackDown, you could actually look at that Buddy Murphy and Roman Reigns match as being one of the best things of the entire week for WWE. The entire SummerSlam weekend. So how, again, I'd love for anybody to elaborate. How is he a loser? How is he a loser? And then after the match, Roman put him over on social media. Now, what I hope is that WWE seen this and Buddy Murphy is going to continue getting opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. I swear to God, if they don't, they are absolutely out of their minds. 
I hope to God that WWE creatively writes. Even though Buddy Murphy was approached by Roman Reigns in this situation and it was an apparent botch. We don't know how, we don't know why. But he's in the storyline. I hope that WWE writes him as a part of this story storyline. I hope that they continue to put Roman Reigns and Buddy Murphy together in this storyline. And gives Buddy Murphy uh, another role here. You know? After what we've seen with Rowan, probably not. Roman uh, Rowan threw, threw him around in the locker room on SmackDown Live. So that probably takes Buddy Murphy out of the equation. You know? Because he admitted to Brian and Rowan that he lied. But I hope to God that they do something with him. He's in the King of the Ring. I don't think WWE... Well, the King of the Ring was announced on Monday. I think even more so now, WWE is really backing their decision to put Buddy Murphy in the King of the Ring after what they've seen on Tuesday. So the King of the Ring announce, announcement was made on Monday. The participants were announced on Tuesday morning. So this is going to be awesome for Buddy Murphy. I can't wait. He's going to be one of those guys that is going to be someone to watch in that entire tournament. Now, Roman Reigns looked back, like I said, at his bat, at his match with Buddy Murphy and the storyline surrounding Roman's attacker. It was a nice one-off feud here for this, and Buddy Murphy was made into a character here in this overall saga with Roman Reigns and Daniel Bryan, which obviously will end with Daniel Bryan and Roman Reigns. Now, it was clear that Roman Reigns was very appreciative of Buddy Murphy's efforts and he also took to social media, like I said, in order to give his thoughts on Buddy Murphy. He says this, and I quote, meant every word I said about at WWE Murphy in the ring. He said he wanted a fight, and he got one. Tonight was my night, but I'm sure it won't be the last time I'll stand across from you. Hashtag secrets out. That is, that is a W in my eyes, folks. I don't give a shit what anybody says. That is the biggest win of Buddy Murphy's entire fucking life. To have Roman Reigns go on his social media and everybody in that thread show appreciation for Buddy Murphy, man. That is a victory. I don't want to hear anyone ever say Buddy Murphy is a loser after that. There's no losers here. Roman looked good. Roman continued the storyline. Buddy Murphy got to shine for 13 minutes against the number one guy in this company who is a former multi-time WWE champion. Don't give me that shit. Watch smarter. Don't be stupid. Buddy Murphy is a superstar. In the making. I hope WWE realizes that he is no longer a secret. Eric Bischoff. I mentioned. I mentioned. On SmackDown Live this Tuesday. That with the cliffhanger. That we seen with Roman and Daniel Bryan. Daniel Bryan and Roman Reigns. Had a confrontation. And Daniel Bryan says. It wasn't me. It wasn't us. We are clear. But I do have information. And I do know. And I will reveal tomorrow. Or, or next week rather. To you who the culprit is, and who is attacking you. So Daniel Bryan is revealing next week who the culprit is in these Roman attacks. Another cliffhanger. We've been seeing cliffhangers, and that has been one of the things that people have been saying about WWE television, that they want changed. They don't give you any reason to watch next week. And I'm wondering, this hasn't happened before. WWE really hasn't done this all that often, if at all, with the cliffhangers, they don't give you any reason to watch. You know, on Monday Night Raw, we're starting to see WWE announce most of, if not all, of the show on social media to give you guys what is going on or give you guys a heads up as to what's going on. Before Paul Heyman got involved, WWE used to never do that. Maybe a match here or a match there. They never used to announce six fucking matches plus all the segments that are happening on a three-hour Raw. This has been happening regularly for the last three weeks, and I appreciate that because WWE needs to do that to get people interested in the show, and they should be doing that along the seven days of the week. As soon as that Raw ends on Tuesday, you start announcing what's happening next week on Monday Night Raw, and you make this a common thing every single week. Same thing with SmackDown. Same thing with SmackDown. Don't wait till the day of to announce the entire show. Spread it out across the week. Get people interested in Monday Night Raw. I honestly feel with Paul Heyman there, that's one of the things that has been changed because they never used to do that. I said the same thing about Eric Bischoff on SmackDown Live. This feels something, this feels like something different on WWE television. This is coming from an external source, a different set of eyes, you know, a different mind here on SmackDown Live. Maybe it is Vince. Maybe it is Bruce Prichard. Maybe it's fucking Ryan Ward. I don't know. But I said on my SmackDown review, 
there's got to be some sort of Eric Bischoff influence in the recurring theme that we're seeing with these cliffhangers, cliffhangers, cliffhangers that lead us into SmackDown Live week after week after week with this Roman storyline. Seems like an Eric Bischoff thing to do. He's in, he's in television. He's in reality television. He knows. He's got a TV mind. What do people want when they're watching a show? They want a reason to tune in the following week. I could see Eric Bischoff absolutely being a part of that. But I got news on Eric Bischoff's creative role, and apparently, I was wrong. I was wrong. That doesn't mean he didn't have a say, but nobody really knows. Brian Alvarez mentioned this on Wrestling Observer Live, that Eric Bischoff does not seem to have any inputs on the creative direction of SmackDown Live. Therefore, if you enjoyed SmackDown Live on Tuesday, then Eric Bischoff doesn't need any thanks for that. He says, and I quote, so far, to the best of my knowledge, after talking to people there, all Eric Bischoff has done was show up to work. So this is not an Eric Bischoff show. He didn't write this show. I don't think he had anything to do with this show. This, I believe, was a Bruce Prichard and Dave Kapoor effort, and they are putting these shows together, obviously, with Vince McMahon being the one who finalizes everything. Alvarez could say that. That might very well be true, but Eric Bischoff is simply just not showing up to work. He's sitting in on these creative meetings. He's sitting there and becoming acquainted with everything. I am sure Eric Bischoff has a mouth. I'm sure Eric Bischoff is sitting there with a laptop or an iPad or a notepad, whatever his means are by writing notes. I'm sure Eric Bischoff has pitched something for creative. I'm not sure if he's ready completely to take over the show or give majority input here, but I do think that he has had some, some say in that boardroom during SmackDown's creative meetings. There's no way that Eric Bischoff is remaining silent in his new position as executive director of SmackDown Live. There's no way. So, Brian Alvarez might be correct, but I also don't think that Eric Bischoff is remaining silent and just showing up to work. When I hear Eric Bischoff is showing up to work, I get this notion of, well, well, there you go, Vince McMahon just signed Eric Bischoff so that he doesn't go to AEW or they don't court Eric Bischoff to come aboard on AEW. That's all I think of when I hear that. Showing up to work, the guy's doing something. I honestly think he has some input, a morsel of input on these shows. So let's see what happens in the future. Hopefully he takes on a bigger role because I... Would love if this show is directed by a new set of eyes and a new mind and someone who isn't stuck in the WWE world like half of these idiots writing this show. WWE's intention with Kofi Kingston and Randy Orton. Brad Shepard noted on the Oh You Didn't Know podcast that WWE's intention behind Kofi Kingston beating Randy Orton down like he did was to give Kofi an edge. However, according to his source, this might not be well received across the board considering their vast size difference. He says, and I quote, I was speaking to a source in WWE about the rivalry between Kofi Kingston and Randy Orton. The source indicated that they were trying to give Kofi an edge by having him beat down Randy and Randy playing the role of a bully. The source said that they aren't buying it because it's not Kofi's natural style and he looks like a pipsqueak next to Randy Orton who is legit 6'4", 6'5", and 235 pounds, end quote. I don't know what they're doing with Kofi Kingston. That, that, that might very well be true. I could see that being a thing, you know? They're breaking, or Randy Orton is being used to break Kofi out of his, you know, his positivity shell. They're using Randy Orton to do Randy Orton dick-like things to Kofi Kingston, so that breaks him out of his natural setting, you know? Kendo sticks and you know, doing what he did at SummerSlam and, you know, defending his family's honor when Randy Orton knows how to push those buttons just right. If it works, it works. It's not going to make me like Kofi Kingston anymore, but Randy Orton, like I said, it's inevitable that Randy Orton's becoming the WWE champion. Randy Orton is not going to be in this feud. He's not going to be placed in this position with Kofi Kingston if he's not going to win the WWE championship. The end is near for IHOP. Kofi Kingston... Please, an extra side of syrup on those pancakes without a side of WWE Championship. I honestly can't wait. I am over Kofi Kingston as the WWE Champion. But WWE did an admirable job at building him up as a solid babyface champion. They gave him a solid run. It's got to be commended. But now is the time to get the belt off of him. And now the big boys need to come on in and take place 
when SmackDown moves to Fox 5. Fox 5 here in New York, Fox Sports, whatever your Fox affiliate is, goons, I don't know. Fox 5 here, because that's all I know. Vince McMahon! I hate talking about Vince McMahon, but I don't blame him on this particular story. Vince McMahon reportedly is upset with Jimmy and Jay Uso, and rightfully so. Brad Shepard reports that things might not be too good at the Uso penitentiary right now. He is reporting. Brett Shepard says this, and I quote, I'm told the Usos have benefited from what is perceived internally as a lack of tag team talent, which I, I don't even understand because WWE has a ton of tag team talent that they just refuse to use. So Brett Shepard might be saying that, but WWE has all these tag teams that they're not using. They have no tag team division outside of two teams. Two teams. So much so that the rumored match for the SmackDown Live tag team titles are a Raw team in the Revival versus the New Day. And the Revival just lost the tag team titles. The Revival just lost the tag team titles on Monday Night Raw. So I don't understand the logic here. But he says anyway, they have benefited from a lack of tag team talent and they would be taking a backseat otherwise. Vince McMahon is furious with them over the traveling issue. Now, now the traveling issue is that the Usos were not allowed into Canada for their situation. Now, the Usos just signed a new WWE contract, so they're sticking around for the next five years. And they're also, you know, if you really want to think about it, definitely one of the best tag teams in the world. But their actions have been deplorable, and hopefully they learn their lesson. I hope so. I seriously hope so. But they're not on Vince McMahon's good list right now. They're on Vince McMahon's shit list. It was reported last week that Jimmy and Jay Uso had been pulled from wrestling on this week's Raw, SmackDown, and SummerSlam. Many speculated that this could be due to Jimmy Uso's recent DUI arrest, and Dave Meltzer has confirmed this to be the case. The reason the Usos, he says, weren't on any of the shows SummerSlam weekend was because of his DUI arrest. Jimmy Uso could not make it into Canada. So there is that, folks. So I don't know what's going to happen, but the Usos right now, the, the most important thing is for Jimmy to get help and for Jimmy to realize that he fucked up and he can't continue fucking up. And WWE needs to realize that the more that they do this, the more responsibility they have on them to step in and make this situation right. No longer can they go out on social media and say, well, Jonathan Fatu is responsible for his own actions. No. One time is not okay on a DUI, okay? Any other time that you fuck up, maybe you have a marijuana situation or you, know, you or you get pulled over wrongfully and you're not drunk or whatever. Whatever the case may be. Minor fuck-ups here. No one should drink and drive. Should have never happened in the first place. He's a fucking idiot just for getting behind the wheel, period. But WWE let this slide once, let this slide twice, let this slide three times. At what point? And we said this time and time again, is it going to end? How many times can they sit and just hide behind the keyboard while well, Jonathan Fatu is responsible for his own actions? When is he going to be responsible for his own actions? When he fucking kills somebody? Give me a break. Step in and make this right. He is a figurehead of your company. He looks bad. The company looks bad. Vince doesn't want that. That's all he needs for the shareholders. Oh, Jonathan Fatu was drunk behind the wheel. We didn't do anything about it. He fucking killed someone. He killed a family. Drove some family off the road. He killed his fucking brother. God forbid he kills his fucking wife. Come on. Enough is enough. Of course Vince McMahon is fucking pissed and rightfully so. They are an image of him. I don't agree with Vince McMahon more times than not. This I agree with. They need to be punished. They need to be reprimanded. Get help. Then we'll talk about booking the Usos and getting them back in a situation where they can contend on Monday Night Raw. WWE is bringing back Bash at the Beach. Supposedly. Oh, really now? You want to bring back Bash at the Beach? Meanwhile, AEW just had something like Fight for the Fallen or Fighter Fest or whatever. And Cody Rhodes is talking about possibly copywriting and trademarking some old WCW names like Bash at the Beach. Now WWE wants to bring back Bash at the Beach. According to a source in WWE to Brad Shepard, a WWE Network special in Hawaii has been discussed. Two potential names thrown around so far. Bash of the Beach, and one that I hope doesn't happen because it sounds absolutely ridiculous. Havoc in Honolulu. 
Man, whoever made that up, please, just hand in your fucking pink slip and just go. Just go, please. Just go. Hand in your fucking keys, hand in your fucking, you know, your, your, your fucking pass, and just go. Okay? Just, I don't even want to hear from you. Havoc in Honolulu? Are you kidding me? Bash at the Beach sounds a lot better. Now, bringing back Bash at the Beach is a great idea. I've said this for years. I've said this right on this fucking podcast. Royal Rumble, Elimination Chamber, WrestleMania. In April, you could do WrestleMania. Then in May, you could do, I don't know. You want to do the Extreme Rules pay-per-view? Do the Extreme Rules pay-per-view. But you got to live up to the name. June, King of the Ring. July, Bash at the Beach. August, SummerSlam. September, you guys can do... You want to keep Clash of Champions, Night of Champions, whatever. Okay? That's that's fine. October, Halloween Havoc. November, Survivor Series. December, Starcade. Enough of these gimmick pay-per-views. I don't mind Extreme Rules because Extreme Rules could be something fun if you really want to go ahead and book accordingly and make the pay-per-view mean something. Bash at the Beach. Your summer should be epic. Your summer should be epic. King of the Ring in June. And the winner of the King of the Ring is the main event or in the main event of SummerSlam. Easy. Gives you an entire fucking just stress-free environment. You got your main event for SummerSlam already set. Build accordingly. King of the Ring in June. July is Bash at the Beach or the Great American Bash or whatever. Bash at the Beach preferably. And then August, SummerSlam. September, Clash of Champions. October, Halloween Havoc. This is what we need. We need pay-per-views to go along with what's happening in the corresponding month. We need them to be special. We need them to feel epic. So Bash at the Beach is something that I would welcome with open arms. It might just be a regular WWE special event and not a pay-per-view. But it should be noted that WWE is headed to Honolulu on September 22nd, which is a Sunday. But the week before, September 15th, they are doing Clash of Champions. You can't have two pay-per-views in a single month. Maybe they do a special event. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see what happens. But I am all for Bash at the Beach. Sheamus. News on Sheamus. We're going to wrap up here. We got a couple more stories, then we're going to get the hell out of here, man. Brad Shepard's reporting about Sheamus. He's in great shape, and there's talks about a comeback in the works for the Celtic Warrior. He says this, according to a source in WWE, a Sheamus comeback is in the works. He apparently feels great and is not retiring yet, fella. End quote. I would love if Sheamus came back. Pair him with Cesaro. Cesaro is drowning on his own. Cesaro is never going to be pushed on his own by WWE. The bar. Back together. And while you're at it, get the rest of the tag team division on par so that there is legit competition, man. Cesaro was great, but we all know he's not going anywhere on his own. Sheamus comes on in. Right then in there, it's an instant boost to Cesaro and an instant boost for Sheamus. Not only that, I don't have any interest in Sheamus as a singles guy. I think they are fantastic together. Get them back together and let's start building the tag team division. WWE is reportedly considering a big farewell match for one Lita. Brad Shepard is reporting on the Oh You Didn't Know podcast that WWE is considering giving Lita a big farewell match this time around. Not only that, WWE is considering Evolution 2.0. And if they go through it in a farewell match for Lita has been mentioned. Other sources are reporting that WWE and their their higher-ups, they stated that Trish and Alexa Bliss, apparently there are people in the company that mentioned that Trish and Alexa Bliss talk frequently and want to do a match Now, good thing Trish already announced her retirement. This was her last match at SummerSlam because if I had to sit through Trish and Alexa Bliss, I would rather bleach my eyes so I didn't have to see the horrific nature of what is to come in that ring. You thought Alexa Bliss was bad. Wait till she gets in a ring with somebody who had to be carried for 90% of the match by Charlotte Flair because she was completely out of her element. I don't want to see that nor does anybody else. That's just going to be another asterisk and another fucking thing on Alexa Bliss's resume that she does not deserve. Bliss is a huge fan of Trish Stratus, apparently. Who isn't? And this could be a dream match for her. And the source says, and I quote, they both talk about the match all the time. It was a missed opportunity. They still want to make the match happen, but who knows if they will ever get that chance. 
Now, WWE is thinking about pulling the trigger on another Evolution event as well, but they were not confident in the star power to do one without a Ronda Rousey. This is their fault. You have neglected the women's division so much that you are now blaming it on them. Meanwhile, you should be blaming it on yourselves. That is ridiculous. Monday Night Raw's women's division took an instant increase in interest because of Sasha Banks coming back. Now we got Sasha and Becky. Shayna Baszler more than likely is getting called up imminently. We don't know when that's happening. Ronda Rousey's coming back. Those names in itself will make Monday Night Raw's women's division must-see television. But apparently they did not want to go through with Evolution because they were not confident in the star power, yet they're too stupid to realize that they are to blame for that even being a thing. It was reported in WWE that they feel more confident about their top superstars in the women's division that they are considering holding another Evolution event. Really now? You know, I, 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 don't, I, I don't really know how you guys think about this, but all I know is you don't really need superstars like Ronda Rousey, and you don't need any outside So You don't need a Nikki Bella for an Evolution. How the fuck, and I mean this wholeheartedly, how the fuck can you watch TakeOver Toronto and Io Shirai and Candice LeRae and what they did and not think that that's all you need? That's all you need for an Evolution show. I, I, I don't understand it. Star power? You give the women to fucking go out there and do what they did? That's all you'll need? People will be talking about that for years. That is all you need. You don't need a Ronda. You don't need a Nikki Bella. You don't need these fucking Hall of Famers. You need Trish. You don't need Trish. You need EO. You need Candice to do what they did. That was a near five-star match. The best women's match of the year. That's all you need on Evolution. That's all you need to make that show memorable. I don't understand this worry about lack of star power. You have the fucking star power. EO and Candice proved that. They proved it. Plus, you got Tony Storm, and you got Rhea Ripley, and you got Ginny, and you got all these others from NXT UK. You got all this, Bianca Belair, the list goes on and on. I could book a dream show with the matches that, uh, with the matches possible with the women that you have in WWE right now. It's unbelievable how WWE does not trust any of their women. No, you don't trust any of their any of your women because the majority of them are not blonde. You trust four who are blonde. If they're of a different color, of a different nationality, you don't trust them. That's why you don't trust them, because you don't want to give the opportunity to anybody that's not fucking blonde. Give me a break. Candice LeRae's blonde. She should have no problem going on. Evolution. She's blonde. I'm not sure if you realize that. Oh, but she's better than everybody else on the fucking main roster. That's why you won't book her. We can't have her outshine Charlotte Flair. We can't have her outshine... Alexa Bliss, God forbid. Fucking idiots. Getting out of here, man. One more thing. WWE going right back to making a huge mistake because they don't think they've already announced a huge 20th anniversary show for SmackDown's Fox debut. The 20th anniversary for SmackDown Live is April 29th. We already had a 20th anniversary of SmackDown Life. But October 4th, apparently, is it the 4th or the 5th? Whatever. October 4th, October 5th, is apparently the new date for their 20th anniversary. Now, this is happening on Fox, and WWE is setting up the Staples Center for the debut of Fox to include Hall of Famers like Kurt Angle, Lita, Mick Foley, Booker T, Hulk Hogan, Trish Stratus, Goldberg, Jerry the King Lawler, Mark Henry, Ric Flair, and Sting. And Sting. WWE wants The Rock to show up, and WWE has reached out to The Rock, and I don't know if The Rock is going to say anything at all, or if he's going to show up, but he might show up, but at least we have big names confirmed for this show. WWE is turning what should be a celebration of talent on the roster now into another fucking shit show that is going to showcase old stars and not do anything to get the new stars over. You have two hours on Fox from 8 to 10 and you're going to litter this show with fucking Mark Henry and Jerry the King Lawler and Goldberg and Sting. Give me a fucking break. How about you book the fucking show to what you have on the roster right now? The rating is going to be big anyway. 
Anyway, we're going to go right back to square one with, with what we did with the Raw reunion. They popped a big rating, a 3.5 rating, right? What happened the next week? It went right back down to where it was last, th that it's always been for the majority of 2019. You didn't keep any of those viewers on that show to watch the following week. And this is what WWE is going to do again. Who's going to watch the next week if all you do is shroud out fucking legends and retirees and fucking people who can't wrestle? Nobody's going to want to watch next week. That's not the interpretation of what you want the audience, a new audience on Fox, to think about your company. You want to show off a Lesnar and a Ricochet and an Andrade and an Ali and a Roman Reigns and a Buddy Murphy and all these guys. All these guys. You want to give them a reason to tune in next week. AEW ain't trotting out Bret Hart and Tully Blanchard, and they're not making those guys the focus of the show. It's about the talent signed to the roster. WWE is absolutely fucking mental if they think this is going to work. I don't want to see this type. I hate these types of shows. I hope these shows die a fiery death. We don't need them. How many times is WWE going to be able to do this? How many more times are they going to be able to do this and get away with it every single year? I, I don't get it. I just don't understand it. What the most important thing is for WWE is not the rating of this show. This is going to be a high rating whether there's legends or not on the show. The most important rating here in WWE is the one that happens the following week and the weekend and the week after that and the week after that. Because you get a glimpse of the consistency, whether it's up, whether it's down, whether it's up, it's down, whether it's just down. Same thing happened with the Raw Reunion. Everybody's like, oh, look at that, Monday Night Raw has the biggest rating of the year. For what? It was a nothing show. You put that show in the middle of a SummerSlam build that didn't need to be, and you minus one week from the overall SummerSlam build. Which was a lackluster show in its, in its own right because of WWE's laziness to build towards SummerSlam. And the rating the following week... You kept none of those viewers who watched. All those viewers watched for Stone Cold. And all those, view all those viewers watched for Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan. You need to watch. You need to get the people to watch the new talent like they do Stone Cold and Hogan and Ric Flair. And you do that by putting them on television and making them a fucking focus of your show. Enough of these cheesy fucking nostalgia programs. God, I fucking hate it. It's going to make me not want to watch the show. Because if it's anything like Monday Night Raw, that was three hours and they built no new storylines. This is two hours. You think they're going to do any better? If they don't build anything towards the next week and they don't have a big storyline or a big fucking match, I'm done. I'm not even watching the fucking show. Getting out of here, guys. Thank you so very much. This is Off The Script, part two, episode 287. If you enjoyed the video, please hit that thumbs up. And better yet, if you enjoyed the video, hit that subscribe button down below and turn on all notifications, man. Make sure you guys follow me on social media, at JD from NY206. That's on Twitter and Instagram. Patreon.com slash JD from NY206. Harry's.com slash script for your $13 value trial set. And make sure you guys check out Ridge as well. Ridge.com slash script. Code script at checkout for 10% off. And if you guys want to go check out all the other videos that you might have missed this week, Everything you need is easy access, man. Easy as cake. Easy as cake being pulled out of the oven in Titus Catering. Down below in the comments, I'm going to pin that comment at the very top. Everything you need is right there, man. Thank you guys so very much. I will hopefully be back on Sunday with more off the script, depending on if there's any news, any late-breaking news. I will be in Boston from Friday on into Sunday morning, and I will be back here in the office on Sunday afternoon, and if there's anything worthy of an off the script, you guys will see it uploaded in your subscription boxes, and please make sure you guys are following me on Twitter, you guys will be notified of what's going on with the channel activity as well. Thank you guys so very much, again, hit that thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, I will be back hopefully on Sunday with more off the script this weekend for episode 287, guys. Have a great Saturday, and hopefully I'll see you right back here on Sunday afternoon. See you then.